to be smart is not necessarily to have a you know great IQ and all of these other things, but to rigorously understand and with authority command the responsibilities you have in the office. Business of Architecture, episode 358. Today, we continue honoring the women in architecture and their accomplishments with our interview with architect Julia Nagel. Nagel is making her mark on the Seattle skyline as she's currently leading the design of her second high-rise tower in the city while working at the firm Hewitt, at which she is a principal and the director of design. On today's interview, you'll discover the skills Julia feels are essential for firm leaders, as well as her approach to winning the right commissions. There's a lot of gold in this interview. I know you're going to love it. So without further ado, here is today's show. Julia, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, it's nice to be able to chat with you, Enoch. You bet. Now, your title at Hewitt is your principal and design director. Right, correct. I'm principal and director of design for the architecture studio at Hewitt. We're a multidisciplinary office. So we have landscape architects, we have a transportation group, and we also have the architecture studio that myself and my partner, Sean Lucas, can run. Now, what does it help me understand? What is it like to go from a designer, which is a very specific skill set, uh, to then moving into a management role? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, that, that's, that's very true. It is a different kind of skill set. Uh, I, I think I had a background where um, I've got a little bit of a taste of the business side of architecture in that uh, the Great Recession when we were working and it was really hard to have jobs. I was one of those people where jobs just sort of went away. And I found myself with a laptop and an, and an LLC essentially and um, trying to uh, find work. So it was, uh, even though my skill set was a designer and, and a project architect and sort of, you know, carrying projects in that regard uh, for a good part of my earlier part of my career, all of a sudden I had to learn about, you know, all of the aspects of business and what multipliers were and how I had to pay my taxes and, you know, the expense of printing materials and everything that you had to do. And, you know, with that, with that experience, when I was at Hewitt, um, I started in 2011 and then became a partner in 2014, then the director of design in 2018, um, that I had a little bit of a background just uh, because of a trial by fire and that experience of, of just trying to make some ends meet with um, uh, working on small residential projects and uh, with, again, you could call it a business, but it really was a laptop and an LLC um, that made that happen. But I, I think that preparation allowed me um, a little bit of insight when I became partner in that just knowing the basic vocabulary uh, of a business was something that um, I had a direct need to learn uh, a handful of years prior. And uh, to also understand the idea that there was no magic business formula. There's no mathematical equation, equation to make all of your key performance indicators happen at the level of business. It really is people focusing and paying attention to all of the aspects of a business and uh, shepherding all these issues through day in and day out. What would you say would be the key the key skills that maybe aren't so utilized as a designer, or maybe they are, but when you move up into management, did you find any of those that you felt like you had to relearn or learn over? What's the difference in, in your mind in those two roles? Yeah, what translates and what doesn't translate from the things that got you to be a principal, then once you're a principal, then what are those things that are valuable? And, and I think an, maybe another aspect of that kind of question is what kinds of things that made you successful to become a partner uh, you know, you sort of have to also have to understand what, what are things that maybe you aren't as good at, but your partners are. And, and I think there's a lot of aspect of that in our group, whereas we have six partners in, in our office and between, we have essentially two for each studio. And most of the partners have a management background. And there's two of us that have a design background. And I think with my design background, I have to take the basic skills that got me to got me there. But I think they do translate in that, um, you know, it really is about paying attention and being super prepared for all the issues that might be at hand and things just don't happen automatically. What I mean by that is the way that I approach design and uh, the way it's, it's actually translated into core values for our studio. And two of our core values is to be smart and be creative. And my partner Sean and I wrote those values as a means to basically understand what the expectations are, no matter what people's responsibilities are, no matter what their expertise are, 
um, whether they're in accounting, whether they're in management, whether they're in design, we'd ask people to be smart and be creative. And what we mean by that is uh, to be smart is not necessarily to have a you know great IQ and all of these other things, but to rigorously understand and with authority command the responsibilities you have in the office. So we wrote those that's not necessarily for just a designer, but it could also be for an office manager. And then um, following that is the value to be creative. And so we're asking people once there's that rigorous exploration and commanding with authority your responsibilities, you can find innovative ways to do your work. And so that translates directly into um, the, th the stuff that I do at the office in terms of directing the design of our projects, but then also that can happen. You can be creative and innovative in how you think about invoicing. You can be innovative and creative in how you think about, um, uh, you know, um, managing staff or all the other things that happen in um, the sort of the principal world, not necessarily the director of design for the architecture studio world. So you did mention that when you, you were hired at Hewitt in 2011, if I got you that did. right, uh, in 2014, you said you became yes. a partner uh -huh. and then in 2018 you became the design director of design yes right so um the the office uh hewitt is a is an office that's been around since 1975 so we're known in the seattle area um and uh we are uh, myself and sean and the others we represent the second generation of leadership in the office so i became a principal in 2014 and there was a long arc of a leadership transition in the office almost let it was like a 10 year sort of process somewhat exaggerated and lengthened because of the great recession uh, but the the founder moving out of the office and the second generation leadership of coming into the office you know takes a long long time and by the time i became a partner in 2014 um, then on to the director of design for the architecture studio in say 2018 um, that was part of the the larger sort of transition from uh, my predecessor David Hewitt to my role now in the architecture studio. What are the key the key skills that you think uh, architects should have uh, if if they move into firm leadership positions? Besides being smart and being creative, right? <laughs> yeah, besides those possessing two, possessing those values. You know, I, it's it's a really great question, Enoch, because you know. Um, there is you're thinking about the design there's the design work that you do but then there's your approach and your day in and day out setting the tone of the work that you do the way that you approach the design i think is really important and i think uh, for me and i can really only speak about like you know my personal my my experience is i've had these other things in my life that i think i found to be more valuable than i understood them at the time um, and some of those things have been things that people have said to me in passing um, there was a um, situation uh, during my graduate school years, my last semester, I was doing my thesis and at the University of Maryland College Park, you have the opportunity in your last graduate uh, uh, graduate program when you're doing your thesis to apply to be a teaching assistant for graduate design studio for the undergraduates who are in the program. And I wasn't going to initially apply for that. And uh, Brian Kelly, my, <clears throat> one of my professors, encouraged me to do so. I didn't think I could do my thesis and and uh, teach at the same time, but he's encouraged me to do that. And just that in, in passing a little bit of encouragement, I think uh, led, me to, led me to sort of, I went and did it and I was a teaching assistant and I taught undergraduate students, I really loved it. And so when you're doing that, you get a little taste of how do you organize all of these different projects all of the students are doing and you get a little sense of, you know, um, that bigger organizational um, uh, practice where you are responsible and tr you need to understand all of the different students. It's very like, it's very, it translates into the office. And so that was just a passing comment. And I think those kinds of things uh, have been really helpful for me to reflect upon um, uh, what uh, Professor Kelly told me back then. The other thing that I found to be really useful, and this is more, more the business management side of things as well, is uh, I had an athletic background. And so I've, you know, been a lifelong runner. I started uh, running when I was 13. I still run every day. And I think there's a discipline, there's a rigor. Um, when you're a long distance runner, I remember back in the day, we didn't have, you know, uh, we didn't have smartphones and, and Apple watches and those things that record and track all of your data and log all of your time, sort of doing it all by hand. But you had to have a long term, long arc sort of eye on where you wanted to go and how you could get there. 
And I think that sort of uh, experience and that sort of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, that's that's sort of uh, habits that I developed through running really do translate. And where do you want your office to go? How do you get there? Um, I of, often will tell my partner Sean or others around me if we're trying to deal with a difficult situation. You, um, you know, I'll say, well, let's worry about today's problems today. We'll worry about tomorrow's problems tomorrow. We'll keep our eye on, you know, um, tomorrow's problems and where we want to go. But this is what we have to deal with today. And I really think the athletic background has given me a lot of um, uh, a lot of experience in, in, in thinking about uh, managing. It's, it's funny, too, when I was teaching, uh, because now I'm also an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington. So my experience of doing my thesis and teaching at the same time, uh, when the opportunity came to teach at the University of Washington and still be you know, director of design and have my you know, quote unquote day job, that was hard to turn it down because I was able to do it before. And what I love about that is teaching students again is is they all have different personalities you have to understand who they are it's no different than the office yet all of the staff have different personalities they all have strengths and weaknesses and they all have different kinds of skill sets and you have to understand those skill set to put them in the right place to be successful and and it's almost like a, the 10-week quarter program at university of washington um, gives me a lot of really intense practice and different kinds of students from different kinds of backgrounds with different kinds of skill sets to sort of see how I can get the best out of where they'd like to go with their work. And I think that kind of experience really does help uh, translate back into the office because we do, we are a design focused firm and we do set up our office as a classic um, design studio. So much like school, we focus on model building. We have pinup space uh, where we like to be highly collaborative. That serendipitous exchange of good ideas is really valuable to us. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and I think the sort of the day in and day out management, um, these, there's, there's these other things outside just sort of design studio and design work that I found to be really valuable when you're thinking about managing and leading. Amazing. Julie, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about business development. Sure. What have you, what have you found to be the most important uh, skill set or things to be able to actually bring in new client work to win? new clients? Uh, great question again. Uh, there's no trick or there's no spell. If I could cast a spell over a potential client and they come to us, yeah, you know, it doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. There's none of that. I was, that hoping, be, I was hoping you'd reveal yeah, your secret Yeah, that would be sauce, really cool. Julia. So I got this spell book back here and I just go to Pete, you know. Yeah. Um, well, again, you know, part of our, our practice at Hewitt, we've been, you know, we've been in, in Seattle for 45 years or so and, 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 and we have that name recognition. Um, because we've been we've been established, a lot of our work is in uh, Seattle. We have work that happens outside the city. We do work in Bellevue, which is just across Lake Washington. Our landscape architecture group even has a little bit broader reach as well. And uh, so, some of our calls are inbound calls. And I think business development isn't necessarily um, it doesn't stop at when you go to a networking event or you go to a ULI conference or something like that. It doesn't stop and start. It doesn't only happen in those kinds of spaces. It happens every day for us. We found that uh, if we can be smart and be creative and we provide excellent service and we provide uh, innovative and creative solutions that meets our client's goal, essentially just do a really great job. That, that, that is something that lends itself really well for other people to want to work with you. So if we have a, if it translates into a repeat client, if it translates into a new client who's heard about us and heard about our work and heard about our, our expertise and skills, I think that's one of the best ways to um, generate new work is just to the work you have today, you do it really well. Um, and, and then with uh, new work where it's uh, sometimes you're competing uh, and you have to go through the interview process and and we find that very exciting and maybe it's that competitor athletic background again it's sort of you get to compete a little bit and we have a we have a lot of fun doing that we're a small office and a lot of our work is uh especially the recent work because seattle has so much uh has now have an international focus so we might have overseas clients and we have a handful of overseas clients who want to uh, be part of Seattle. They want to contribute to the urban context. And a lot of that urban context revolves around private side real estate business economics, which is 
you know, uh, I don't know what percentage it should be, 90% of the urban environment or this, this fabric of a city is driven by those kinds of economics. There's the signature buildings, there's the civic buildings, there's other things that are driven by other kinds of forces. The work we are prim primarily involved with is in that, is in that sort of fabric aspect of, of the city. And so we have to understand uh, what the needs are, and what the values are, and what the opportunities um, are for that kind of client to contribute to the fabric. And what we often do, especially in a competitive situation, is uh, be very clear of understanding their needs and how their needs isn't diametrically opposed to uh, being innovative, being creative, and contributing to the urban environment in a, in a really unique way. Uh, an example of that is we have an overseas client uh, that um, knew us because we did, a, you know, in this case, it was a skyscraper. We have a 40-story a tower in downtown Seattle. It's actually next to our office. I looked at the site. It was out my window across the alley, 18 feet away. That was the site for you know my first skyscraper project, which is very unusual and never expected. And we, we got ourselves established with that project. And when there was another um, group that was interested in being part of that neighborhood, it's a really terrific neighborhood adjacent to downtown and Pike Place Market, uh, you know, they, they understood that we have significant experience in, in that situation. So in this, um, in this particular case, when we were competing for the project, we were able to find a design solution through the competitive sort of uh, interview process a design solution that uh, had the right size and shape, but maybe not the right configuration to have a two tower project on the site versus a one tower project on the site. But we found a way, which we called a mama tower because it has a mama and a baby. So it has these two, um, two conditions where we use all of the aspects of knowing the zoning code to reduce the base of the tower, allow for the baby to exist on the street. It allowed a a gap between the building and the baby tower really was that um, that transitional piece between the lower scale fabric of the block that it was situated in. So we had a great uh, a great um, urban design architectural idea for that block, and it was really sort of exceeding um, the goals that the client had for having a place for people to live in downtown Seattle. So you know, for the um, the not the the, the the inbound calls where you may be invited to compete for work is a place where we really want to find um, other areas to be innovative in addition to demonstrating our expertise. And for you, does you mentioned networking, does networking, is it just something that happens naturally? You're naturally the kind of person who wants to pick up the phone and check in with a developer you haven't heard from in a while or check with a banker? Um, or is it something you have to schedule on your calendar? Or do you just Maybe not not necessarily do it, but you do go to the networking events and and by happen chance run across people. What's that like? For yeah, you? all of that. And no, it, it's not something that I think I wouldn't consider it a, a, a sort of a natural uh, thing, a thing that I have. I think because uh, you know my partner Sean and I are very different personalities, and being the director of design and being the person who is leading the design, I'm the one up in front of the conference rooms, you know, sort of leading in front of client groups, uh, which can be, you know, sometimes uh, quite a number of people with some of the projects that we do, or be in front of design review boards, uh, or be in front of community groups when we're doing outreach. So I'm sort of out front uh, all the time where um, Sean is um, super, super expertise. Uh, he's uh, a guy who is much more reserved and I think more comfortable sort of in the background, but he's a great person to sort of as a sounding board to figure out like, you know, in terms of um, in, in terms of our marketing efforts of where do I, where, where should I be placing my energy to be uh, most useful. It's easier to do networking when, you know, you have a client group and you get to know who they are and, and you build trust with them and you have a good rapport with them and you're in, you're in a good standing with them. They really appreciate all the hard work you put in. Then you get to know them, you get to be friends with them. And, you know, then you can kind of, you know, grow your network because they have friends too. And they, you know, the real estate world and, you know, other other areas, they, they do talk with one another. So meeting people is, um, is uh, something that uh, gets a little bit easier over time. I do find it challenging sort of the networking events, like, okay, this is the room, this is the cocktail hour, this is the place where you exchange business cards, those kinds of things. 
you know, you, you might run across people you know already, and that, that's really valuable to see people you don't get to see all of the time. I probably am not like uh, as, uh, as comfortable in those situations as I am in uh, the sort of, you know, building your network sort of in a smaller circle and a more sort of slow, a slow burn or doing it or building your network and getting people to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, consider you for their their for their uh, um, their investment or their opportunity uh, in in doing a really good job day in and day out and sort of building that reputation of being good and, and being experts at what you do. Julie, you mentioned that as the director of design, you're oftentimes in front of the conference room describing the designs, giving the design presentations. You're obviously a very well-spoken person. You probably had a lot of practice doing that in school. So you probably never had the experience where uh, you said something off, you said something wrong, you walked out of the presentation thinking, oh my goodness, I can't believe that I said that, I stumbled. That's probably never happened Oh, no, happened no, to I've you, never right? made mistakes. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, you know, you learn from those mistakes, and I think uh, because of that, you 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 might you might have a little bit different preparation as you go, and the expectation is uh, when there's an important meeting, when there's an important uh, milestone in the cross, and you need a meeting, and you need people to get approval, or you need approval from your client for something that you really think is a good idea, so you have to be super prepared. Uh, and then maybe again, it just circles back to the athletic. Um, um, the athletic background is that you know, as a long distance runner, if you want to have a a good race and you want to do well for yourself, you really have to put in the time to train. You're, it's the sort of even people with natural talent aren't going to do well on a 10,000 meter, you know, uh, race or something like that event put in the training. So we sort of approach it like that. But, the, you know, there, there's times when I've really um, made a mistake and they've been super valuable learning lessons. Uh, there is a time, uh, it's, it's a story, <laughs> uh, when we were working on the uh, the Emerald Tower downtown, the Emerald Tower is that project that's across the alley from uh, our office, and it, and it's a very challenging site. It's only 7,340 square feet at the base of the building. It's in a regular shape because it um, the grid of Seattle streets um, follows the shoreline of Elliott Bay, so it cranks at different angles, and it's one of those sites at a change of a downtown grid to what they call the Belltown grid, which is the neighborhood north. It's a downtown neighborhood, but it's just north of the site. And so it's a regular shape and it's small and it's a really challenging site. Uh, you can only shrink vertical services and circulation as much as you can to have the right ratio of places for people to live versus the services that they need to do that on a tower. And it's one of the most challenging projects I worked on. There was a meeting uh, where uh, with a, they went through a couple of different ownership groups, and it was a tough meeting. As a as a designer, you'll have a number of different um, uh, uh, arms of a of a client group that are responsible for their area of work, and one of them is construction. And I think a lot of people in this business, you know, we try to set up situations where you're not having adversarial um, relationships with. The, the sort of construction world, whether it is the GC or whether it's people who are involved in this sort of construction management on the on the ownership side, but for whatever reason, it was one of those meetings. And as and and you know, there are times as designers, maybe we've all experienced this. Even if you're not a designer, where uh, you get your cage rattled. As much as you try to avoid those situations, you get your cage rattled, and 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 partly you know that sometimes. You know, uh, design can sometimes be seen as additional cost, not not necessarily design as something that is achieving something uh, that's adding value to their uh, investment and making a great contribution and hopefully an innovative, creative way. So it was one of these meetings where I got my cage rattled, and, and it was a situation where I was the only woman in the room. It was only me. It was a bunch of other people in this room. And it was a, one of these hard meetings that I just had to keep my composure and and uh, make your way out of the meeting. And so uh, we, I did that and I, I decided I, I wanted to, the best way to sort of regroup and reassess was I was just going to step out of the office for a while and go for a walk. And, you know, uh, I walked, you know, a, a Again, maybe it's that distance runner kind of thing in me. It was a long walk, but there are essentially three legs to the walk. And, and one of those legs in my mind was just to give myself the opportunity away from the office in the situation to regroup, you know, just to sort of give myself some breathing room 
to uh, get away from that uh, maybe not so great moments of lean-in history, you know, where it was, I was sort of challenging the the the, um, the person in the meeting. And the second leg of the walk was, well, okay, what actually happened in the meeting? Like what, what was the actual cause for the situation and sort of identify what I think outside of the emotion, what occurred. And then the last leg of, walk, of the walk was to, uh, to say, well, what are you going to do about it? And what I learned was through that conversation, I think the very complex client group, the construction people maybe weren't talking to the development people, the development people asked, essentially asked us to design a bigger building. We designed a bigger building, bigger building translates to higher construction costs. You know, things were sort of, you know, passing ships in the night or something like that. But I was going to command with authority, my responsibility to understand what happened. And in this case, I think it was about area. So, you know, you sort of dive into the spreadsheets to understand what the differences of where we were before, what they were pricing versus what we were being asked to do. Uh, that was a Friday on a Monday. I was at the copying machine and I was copying the spreadsheets and the founder, David Hewitt, came up to me and he asked me, what are you doing right now? And I looked down at the um, my spreadsheets and I go, because I've been, you know, obsessing about this all weekend. And I'm like, you yeah, know, I don't know. Well, I said, we got a second? And I said, sure. So he took me to a conference room and that's when I became partner. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. <laughs> so it's, you know, it sometimes it works out to learn from your mistakes, learn what happened, assess, you know, uh, what you can do about it and, and then take it from there, you know? And, and so that mistake of, getting into a confrontational, adversarial, challenging kind of situation in the meeting, I think led to something really valuable where I really want to command all of these areas. So I'm going to put something in front of a client. And it's a standard thing in, 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 in our practice now is when we want to talk about a design issue, if we're not putting the spreadsheets of the numbers that we know are important to the clients, in addition to design, even though we're going to talk a lot about design, you need to have the, that information uh, to make the, the clients comfortable. Uh, and then once they're comfortable, then you can talk about um, design. If we don't do that, there might be a specific reason where we don't do that. Um, but sometimes that's, we almost see that as a gamble. That's, that's, a, that's a great story, Julie. Thank you for sharing with that with us. And I mean, what an emotional, an emotional weekend, I imagine, to go from a challenging meeting like that to then, uh, you know, surprise, now you're a partner. Oh, I, I remember the, this next, the following Saturday was a nice sunny day in Seattle. And, you know, and I was thinking, I, I thought I had a game plan, you know, so I was kind of excited about it. And so um, the weekend wasn't a downer weekend. The weekend was, I, I, I think I know what happened and I think I'm going to be able to sort of iron it out by the time Monday happens. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful reframe. So you mentioned there's there's personality differences between partners. I, I'm curious how is how is how is your office structured? You mentioned there's different studios. Would you help me understand how you guys have the the six partners structured and and how you work together? Sure. Teams? Yeah. Uh, so it's it's interesting because we are structured in three different studios, and we've learned I think just by working with each other as a principal group over over the you know uh, over the years is that when we go to make decisions, we like to have consensus, but we need to have consensus uh, regarding what's best for each studio. And, and I think what we've learned is even though Hewitt Architects Incorporated is a C corporation actually, and we're all under that one, uh, that one umbrella, the studios, the, the, the work that they do, the way in which they do their work, who their client groups are, are very different. Uh, for example, uh, Leigh Ephraim, my partner, she leads our transportation studio. So she works with municipalities in Sound Transit and they do a lot of light rail station work here in the city of Seattle and the region. And so they have a they have uh, an, an entirely different situation where they're oftentimes sub consultants for a primary large engineering firm who are who are doing the work of the you know the light rail um, systems. And then on the other side we have landscape architecture and their business model is a little different too as well as is uh, when we need a landscape architect for our work, we know who to call. I can just turn over and talk to my partner, Chris, when we're all in the office. Uh, but they also work with uh, our other architecture firms. And so sort of navigating the sort of competitor kind of thing is something that we 
deal with all of the time. But they're also consultants to either other architects or ourselves and, and um, uh, you know, things like that. Whereas the architecture group, we're typically the prime uh, and we have consultants. So our business model is a little bit different in how we manage consultants. So oftentimes, I think what we're learning is what these differences are and giving space and, and, have, and, and understanding that um, uh, it's okay for one group to make slightly different decision uh, versus another group to make a, another slightly dis different position because if it's better for them, it's better for the overall office. And so we explain to you know staff that we have this very diverse three groups of uh, three groups of disciplines, and sometimes we have to make different decisions uh, for each one, uh, knowing that we think it's the best choices for the overall uh, overall needs of the office. And. Is there borrowing that happens in terms of staff in these these studios? I'm curious how distinct are they? For instance, if if uh, one studio is a little bit has more work than they than they they can handle, and another studio doesn't have enough, how does that work with the internal billing? Sometimes that can I know can cause competition between you're using my person, you're using mine. Talk to me through the how you guys have managed that in, in the office. How does that work? Yeah, for you? Um, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, you are right. There's a little bit of borrowing that happens, you know, occasionally. Um, we've recently had borrowing where landscape architecture staff might be working for transportation architecture. We have some transportation people working in architecture. The the exchange between transportation and architecture, you uh, because everyone is in the same discipline. It's all architecture. It's the sort of building type is the same. So that even though transportation architecture is very specialized work, our, our work is a little bit more what people would probably think of when they think of you know what it is to do architecture. Um, it's harder actually though sometimes to um, to exchange staff very easily because the uh, because the municipal uh, work, the work with um, agencies, um, have certain requirements and certain contractual relationships and certain teams that is expected to work on their project and it's not easily interchangeable. We've had a couple of people um, migrate over to um, architecture, but that might take a long time. It's not really nimble. It's not like we can put staff on uh, a project to sort of meet a particular milestone or something like that. We do do that in the architecture studio. So as I said, we are classic. Uh, we range sort of as a classic studio environment uh, in the architecture studio at Hewitt. And uh, that might look and feel as the sort of the, the big messy studio, which I think is just great. Um, uh, at the same time, the project teams that might, um, they aren't necessarily their own islands purely. I mean, obviously I'm involved on all of them, but in a, in a studio based um, practice, like we do it, um, we also uh, have a little bit of a departmental uh, flair to it. So if, if we need to, ramp up expertise onto a particular project, whether it's technical expertise or design expertise, we have technical and design resources that will pull. We know who those people are, we're not a big office, and we'll, we'll put, we'll, move, we'll migrate them onto that team to achieve whatever particular need is um, occurring at that time. So we have a studio base with a little bit of departmental flair um, to it. So there's some exchanging that happens in that studio. It's harder to exchange um, uh, in uh, uh, between the disciplines, though. Got it. Got it. So, Julie, I'm just curious to finish up here. What's what's next for you? You've seems like you've kind of reached the pinnacle of your <laughs> career. What's where where do you go from here? Well, I don't feel that way, uh, uh, and you know, I I am very excited about the things that we're doing now. Uh, in the office. Uh, I'm excited about the, the, the work that we have currently, the work that's under construction. Uh, we, are, uh, we also have some work where we partner with other architecture firms uh, outside the city. As an example, we've partnered with Piatuck Architects in Oakland uh, to work on an affordable housing project in Seattle. Um, and that, that was a really great working relationship. We're partnered with Herzog and Demeron to work on a project, their first project in Seattle in the Belltown neighborhood. And we have certain expertise for that. And that's very exciting because you kind of get a little sense of how do these other offices work? How are they organized? What can you learn from them? What, 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 what kinds of things do you find they do really, really well and that you find really interesting? So that's very exciting in addition to uh, our own work. 
Um, you know, along with the mission statements and the core values, you know, there is a there's sort of a vision statement, you know, that we have in in in, in our studio. And, you know, and part of that is is not only the work that we're focusing on, but wouldn't that be great? So sort of, sort of like someday we're known to be this sort of, you know, serious, motivated collection of creative people. You know, we walk into a room and people know who we are. And I think that would be like really great where our work is um, more inbound calls. Uh, and then competitions, P people want to work with us for our innovative solutions, not necessarily expertise on one particular building type or expertise just because we're so familiar with the system uh, of the entitlement process and the permitting process in the city of Seattle. Uh, but they know us as innovative, uh, innovative people that can really contribute to their project. And we sort of sweepingly stand apart from others. So that's sort of like the sort of ambitious goal that we have is more general rather than I want to do you know, X kind of project or this kind of work and that kind of work, you know, it's like, how can we position ourselves to, to be successful under those terms? Yeah, that's beautiful. It's a very, very clear vision. Sounds very exciting. Well, you know, it, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it really is comes down to day in and day out. I think if, especially in my role as setting tone, um, and, and exhibiting those kinds of, uh, core values and exhibiting, you know, where my where the vision uh, might be day in and day out. You know, another example, right? Um, uh, this story we call the delete party. So we had one day we had the delete party. It was say, and I'm really what it is? It's a story about setting the tone. You know what the expectations are, and and really how you can conduct yourself to maybe someday you know sort of reach some of the goals you have for your vision. And and uh, there was a time in a project where in fact, funny, I learned a lot from this one project. So the Emerald Project, again, who had an ownership ch uh, change and the new owners for the project really wanted to make significant changes from uh, four stories down through the building. But they were excellent changes. I think it really was changes that were better for the street, better for the block, better for the city, more active edges. They were moving above grade parking. We thought it was great. They were providing more places for people to live. Uh, but again, it was that really small site, irregular shape, very difficult to solve all of these things, especially all of the, all of the systems that have to vertically move through a building from below grade parking to the conditions that happen at the street to above grade parking to the residential above all of that. And we were at a point where we had all the permits in hand. We're ready to go. We solved all the problems. And then the new ownership group says everything from here down, the first 40 feet, which is so important, urban design, is now gone. Right. And so... You know, there are people, right, you sort of you shake your head and go, oh, man, so much work to do this. But my job was to set the tone going, you know what, gang, this is going to be great. Right. So we had a delete party. Um, my In my practice, I, I work in Revit every day. So I work with our teams. I sort of grew up with CAD and now we do BIM. And even early on in the design work, I'm working with, in Revit. So I'm like, OK, let's open up the Revit model and people who are familiar with this application know that we you can select take open up the whole model select all of the elements and then there's a little number in the bottom right hand corner of your screen will tell you how many elements you have you know thousands of elements that you're grabbing on this model that have been figured out and i picked this man named alex who had to deal with this stair that threaded through all these different conditions of that first 40 feet down to the below grade parking and i said okay alex we're all going to gather around the screen and we're going to push delete and we're going to make it better and it's going to be great and we're going to have a lot of fun doing it. And so Alex pushed it and it blew up, you know, the, you know, all of those thousands of elements <laughs> and had to redesign the building. But that's sort of setting the tone, leading by, you know, example of like, this is going to be okay. And so have that sort of optimism, uh, uh, which is what you need sometimes because this can be a tough business. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, Julie, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, Julie Nagel, for joining us here on the Business of Architecture podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me, Enoch. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, 
fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.